Biden's going to be looking for Joe Biden's going to be looking for a new job or activity in a few months. <laughs> um, he's going to be <laughs> out of a job, it looks like. So, you know, that's maybe somebody along those lines would be a good fit. He's too old. We already we need younger people. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing, amazing place to come in. Uh, yeah, we're talking about maybe bringing more people into the group, but now we are here with our sacred group. Uh, what's up, everybody? Hello. If you're watching this on the YouTube, thank you for being here. And we're going to talk about talk with Radha about her trip that she recently made to Portugal to a spiritual teacher slash leader named Muji, which I've been so excited to hear more about. And we're all going to kind of ask her a few questions. So I'm going to get right into it. Ken, you had a question. It was a good first question. Thank you. What you got for us? My question is, Radha, could you tell us about your background with Muji, a little bit about who he is, how you, you know, what became important to you in getting connected with him and his work and prompted you to go to his retreat in, in Portugal so that before you talk about the actual retreat, it would help me to know the genesis of this involvement and what it's all about. Okay, so um, a friend of mine who had introduced me to Swami Muktananda, who had been has been my teacher since 1972, um, sent me an email uh, in 2019 and said, Radha, I think you ought to watch this YouTube. And um, I'm not the kind of person that goes from spiritual experience to spiritual experience. If I have an introduction to something and it really resonates deeply in me that this is for me, then I don't really look any further. So, so I had never really looked any further than what I had been doing for all those years. So I, and so I checked it out. And the minute I watched the YouTube on Muji, I knew that this person was going to be able to answer many, many questions about my spiritual practice that I did not have answers to. And I knew it from the mo first moment I spoke to him. And the other thing I saw was that my understanding of self-awareness, when I heard his understanding of self-awareness, it like spun my consciousness 180 degrees. Mm. And that's a rare experience and I valued it greatly. So. Uh, from that moment on, I began to watch on YouTube, and he has hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, YouTubes. <clears throat> and so I began to watch it. And the more I watched it, the more I knew that my first intuitive feeling was correct, that a lot of the uh, things I had been practicing without understanding why I couldn't feel that I was fully able to acknowledge the fruit of that um, just began to become very clear to me. And so then last summer, I mean, about a year ago, um, I my back and my went out, my stomach had this weird thing happen. And I was in incredible amounts of pain. And one of the things that Muji, because I did join this news, uh, Sahaja Express, which is like a, a daily or I don't know how many days a week, but usually it's daily of the, the programs or satsangs that are going on right in Sahaja. So I've been watching those, not just what was on YouTube. And um, so one of the talks were about pain. And I recorded them so I could listen to them again and again, because in my life, I've been dealing with a lot of physical pain and illness. So, and I felt his approach, it just stirred in me something very, very deep. I, I don't really have words for it. I don't really don't know how to express it. Um, but I knew what I was hearing was vital for me to, to really stay with. And so when this happened for me and I, he, he was doing during COVID online retreats and I had done all of them. And then when this happened for me last summer, where my back and my stomach went out and I was in terrible pain 24 seven. And I was using the practices, the pointers that he gave to deal with my pain and my relationship to the pain. 
And I felt that I was not doing very well. In fact, I knew I was not doing very well. And I wrote a letter to him. And in the letter, I told him that I was knew that one of my main obstacles in my practices was my identification with physical pain and suffering the pain in my body. And uh, since it's all about self-identifications and personal identifications and how they block us from experiencing who we really are, that's why I felt I could ask that question, okay? And um, he called me. And um, in the course of that conversation, um, he did many things. And one of the things he did was read my letter to me and say to me, he absolutely could help me dissolve that personal identity. If I was open, he could definitely do that. And then he invited me to go to Manta Sahaja, which is the meditation center that he lives in and uh, works from in Portugal. So I said to him, I didn't know how I'm going to do that, given my physical condition. And he said, you're going to be well enough to come. And so uh, six months later, I was definitely well enough. My stomach was fine. My back was no longer in any pain. And so I went to Sahaja. So that's how come I went there. And his teachings, because I've been a clarity coach based in Gestalt therapy for 55 years, and that's all about creating your reality. And it's all about self-awareness. When I say to you that this one video totally turned me completely around to my understanding of self-awareness. That's not a casual statement because I had dedicated myself, my life, my profession to that very thing. So to be able to hear a short talk and in that talk for his explanation to change my, my, my understanding forever. And in that change of my understanding, it changed my perspective of life and how I live my life and how I think about myself, everything changed. And I don't know if you could understand that, but it, it did. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I think that when you go ahead and tell us about your experience in the retreat, it'll, it'll reinforce and help, at least me, I can't speak for others get what's going on. I would ask parenthetically if there's in, if there's a particular YouTube video or information that you would recommend to initiate my understanding of Muji and his work, I'd appreciate your letting me know what that is. So like a plug-in point. Um, but anyway. Well, I, I can't, you know, the, his, his YouTubes now are very different because he's teaching, different isn't really the right word, but He's teaching in a more direct, simplified, he's always teaching the same thing. Because I've looked back at videos that are 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 years old. He's always teaching the same thing. But now, it, and he always has on YouTube the most current, I might add, the most current teachings that he's teaching. Um, and so that's what is focused on YouTube. But if I were checking it out for the first time, I would just go through and see one of the titles that called to me. And that's what I would say to you, because what would call to me might not call to you. So my friend, who is obviously more than just a friend, because she's the only person in my entire life that ever introduced me to both of my spiritual teachers in, in a 60 year period, um, she knew me well enough to say that. We'd been in satsang together for years and years and years. She was the center leader for Swami Muktananda, then I was the center leader. So in other words, she knew me and knew what would resonate with me. So I wouldn't want to tell you anything other than that. Um, if you want to have an introduction, you might look for a YouTube that says Invitation to Freedom. And that is a guided meditation that takes 20 minutes. And it basically gives us the opportunity to have an experience of who we truly are. And he takes us through it through insight, step by step by step by step. So it's not like a visualization. You know what I mean? It's not like a fantasy. It's not like that. 
He's asking you questions and asking you to go inside and then you answer. And then your answers lead you in a certain way to have this experience if, you know, if that's what's going to happen for you. So that's the only recommendation I would make. But if you want to have a feeling for him, then I would say, trust your instincts and go with some videos. Okay, thank you. Sure. I would like to um, pose a question uh, and perhaps Raha could start, but maybe this is for um, everyone in a sense. How often in these, in these journeys and, you know, you all just by the sheer time and have been on these journeys a lot longer than Ian and I, but like how often are you learning something new about yourself that has been mm -hmm. layered and, or is it, you know, I, I understand there's times we may not be learning something new, but seeing something from a different angle, but how often are like new things coming up, new concepts, um, things you may haven't considered and I'll pose it to the whole group. Man, I think we can direct, just direct that to Radha. And I know maybe Bill, because Bill also has learned from Muji, but I've seen like one or two videos just to know that like he's like, uh, and, but he has a lot of good information that I get it, but I don't really know much about him. So I'm going to pass that to Radha or Bill. So, and I, and I want to expand it past um, just Muji for the sake of the conversation, okay. uh, just in terms of like, you know, spiritual journey or going through like some different type of uh practices mm. in order to advance like how often are new things coming up well i sit every day if that's what you're asking i mean i sit every day and i listen to his talks when he when he gives them he's giving less now than he used to because and sometimes i listen over and over again because if there's something there, first of all, I can't tell you that I'm learning intellectually. That That's not what this is about. This is about being pointed, pointed, he points you to the truth of who you are and he uses inquiry, which is like, like an exquisite kind of uh, intellect and intelligence, but far more than that, that, asks you questions that take you, that keep clearing away everything you're not, all the things you think you are, okay? And so it's like, it's like, it's very gentle. But anyway, so it's clearing it all away. It's clearing it all away. It's clearing it all away. And then what are you left with? You see, and what you're left with can never leave. And so he keeps showing you that again and again and again and again in, in so many ways, you know, and laughing and joking and serious and all kinds of ways. So it's not about learning. It's more about applying what, for me, I agree with everything. There's nothing he's saying that I can't say, oh, no, I don't, that doesn't really, or that doesn't sound real. That's never happened. Everything he says goes right into my heart, and I know it's the truth, okay? I don't know other people's experience, but that's my experience. So there's nothing he's saying to me that I don't know inside here, not here. Inside here is absolutely true, okay? That's not enough. It's not enough to know it because it, he's teaching you you need to be it. So the only way you can be it is with practice. So enough times you have the experience and after enough, some people just go and they have the experience and that's it for them. Okay. That's not me. Okay. Um, so you go, you, you have this experience you have, and, and you know, it's the truth, but knowing it and being it are not the same. Does that make any sense to you? Mm -hmm. So the idea is to be able to practice, to be disciplined enough to practice so that you have so many, um, let's say, realizations of being it, that now the identity with the ego just weakens more and more on its own. So it's more of a shifting that you're not doing it. Believe me, you're not, I'm not doing it. Okay. Because if my mind could do it, I would just do it. Well, that's not how it works. Okay. So, so 
so it's almost like you're disengaging. It's like you're disengaging from who you think you are and a beginning to experience, even if for a moment, who you are, even if it starts intellectually, all right? Um, and then you may have sometimes experiences and you go, wow, 40 minutes went by? Wow. And you weren't asleep, but wherever you well, it felt timeless. You would maybe you would have thought five minutes went by. Okay. So that's my experience. Other people could go and have an experience and that's it. They're they're there and they stay there. Uh, that's that's not my not my experience. And the other thing that was so transforming was the amount of love that I experienced while there. There's something about being in an environment where I don't know if it was hundreds or 20 or 30 or 50. All I know is that every single person was all they gave out was love, kindness, care, and compassion. And maybe it wasn't them. Maybe it was me seeing it that way. I don't even know. Okay. All I know is that it was, it wasn't like I was in love. All there was, was love. It's to such a degree that it was like nothing. It was just, it would, you know how little kids, you don't really think of them as being loving. They're just are the little selves. Well, it was kind of like that. There was kind of an innocence to the experience. It just was what it was. And I've lived long enough to know that's very rare. And it was obviously a reflection of this being's presence. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, actually. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. hop in, and that's Bill. Is there anything you'd like to add, or I, I have two sneezes? <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Could you just give us like a quick background of who Muji is? Like, where is he from? What uh, is he under the Hindu? Is he like a Hindu Hindu background, or what well, type of? First of all, he comes from Jamaica, which immediately has that energy. Okay. And like, which are, already I love him because he's got rhythm. So, so, <laughs> so because, at, at, and, and the place where he is the meditation, there's a little, there's a, the place where you can get little things to eat in a little bookstore. It's called Little Jamaica. And it's the place is covered, you know, all the different paints they use, like in that kind of culture, you know, all the bright different colors. That's the way it is. So it does that. You don't walk into like, an ashram with a kind of like mm, kind of energy. You walk into this uh, uh, Aspaman vibration, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So and 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 even the things that are built there, they look like they're growing out of the ground. There must have been 50 places where you could go in nature to sit and contemplate and be. But it wasn't just nature. Out of nature, there'd be a little bench somewhere, or over here, there'd be a little something. So it wasn't like structures the way we think of building that. It was all him, because they told me, because when I said this, they said, he he's the one that created every one of these structures, made them be what they are. So it's, a, it's an expression of who he is. So he comes from Jamaica. I know he spent a lot of years in Brixton, because he talks about it a lot. He lived there a lot. And then- Sorry, where is it? Bricks in England. Bricks in England, cool. And then a young man came. He, I once heard his name, but I forgot. And told him he had to go to India. And he went to India and he met his guru, Papaji, which Papaji's guru is Ravana Maharshi, the I am guru from, okay. So that's the lineage, okay. But you'd be hard pressed to be in his presence and think there was he was following any lineage and I know the difference because I was in city yoga and you knew Swami Muktananda was following city you you had no doubt and the difference is it's very different there, there's uh, the word that comes up there's this I mean don't think I'm not telling you it's discipline it's very disciplined okay 
but there's a softness there. I'll give you one little example. And if I told you this last week, I apologize, but it had such a deep impact on me. As I'm walking around, checking out all these little amazing little outdoor places to sit, they're like sanctuaries. I see a little sign and it says, smokers are welcome. It doesn't say smokers allowed. It says smokers are welcome. And I sat down and I got so choked up because that is the essence of who he is. It is all acceptance. There is no judgment. And right in that little area where smokers are welcome, there's a chair because he comes and sits there sometimes and stays with people. So you see what I mean? A any judgment about what's good, what's wrong, what's right, what's wrong, it, it has no meaning. If you smoke cigarettes, you're welcome to come over here and smoke your cigarettes. Now that doesn't sound like what an ashram would be like. That's what I mean. There's a, welp a welcoming and a softness and an acceptance that in my 83 years of life, I've never experienced anywhere else. And for wow. that alone, it was worth going to Portugal regardless of the fact that I'm still in pain is rather the regardless of what I'm going through, no matter what I'm going through, I don't have one moment of regret because to have lived my life and actually have had this fantasy become a reality that this is who we really are. And we could really live together like this. And having chased that when I went to Maui in 1970 with the flower children and have seeing that it wasn't, it didn't work. Okay. And then going there and seeing this is what it takes to make it work. You have to know who you are. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? Okay. Um, I am interested in like, well, first of all, how long, how many, like, how long were you there for? Well, I was supposed to go for two weeks, but because I got COVID, they wouldn't let me leave um, until I they felt I was strong enough. And um, so I actually arrived on the 8th and on the 28th, I left. And they sent me home with someone because they didn't feel I could fly alone. Wow. Um, yeah, that, I forgot about that part. That's amazing. Um, so, okay, so... I can you just tell me a little bit about like that during that time, what's that almost three weeks? Um, what was like the daily life like? Like what were you doing? Exercises or meditating? I'm sure you were hearing him speak. Like what were you doing there? Well, uh in the morning there was a chant called Arati, and then there was a half hour contemplation. And then there was breakfast, and then um then I guess about, a, I don't know, 11 o'clock or something, there was usually chanting or sometimes he would come and give a talk or if he didn't come and give a talk, they'd have a a, a video of a talk that he had given because uh, he's always giving satsangs. That's, that's what it's called when he speaks to people and answers questions. And um, so, or so there's so many of them. And so they would do that or he would come in person. And um, then you have lunch. <clears throat> And then uh, you do seva, which is service, and um, or you walk around or do whatever you do. And then uh, then you come back again for an afternoon contemplation. And then there's an evening program. Usually if it would be with him or it would be a video. And uh, sometimes there'd also be chanting. And so that's pretty much how the days went. And if you weren't able to go, like when I was ill with COVID, every, uh, on my phone, I had like a little private way to get in so mm -hmm. that I could participate in every one of the programs and not miss out on anything because I couldn't physically go into the the the, uh, the places where they were held being held. So I did, in other words, I, I did all the contemplations and all the meditations and everything you know, with the group, it was live, but uh, it was like a closed circuit live thing. Wow, very cool. Uh, were, were the chants like Hare Krishna type chants or is it something different? Uh, 
Well, they, they they have a group of people who do the chants and they they have all their YouTubes up too. And they chant various chants, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, they chant Om Namah Shivaya, they chant a whole bunch of different chants. They're really mm -hmm. incredibly good. And, um, and then people either chant or get up and dance in the back of the room if they want to get up and dance, uh, which of course I did. And, you know, so that kind of like that. Cool. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to go if anyone wants to pop in. Uh, so you mentioned about the, like a fantasy coming into reality. Can you just talk more like, what do you mean by that? What fantasy that, and what was it like to live that, I guess? Well, when I was a little girl, and I can't really say there was anything in my physical environment that would have made me think this way. But anyway, I always believed that it inside of people, uh, which is I'm sure why I got into my work, um, I never thought of saying a spark of divinity because I didn't have that kind of a religious or spiritual background. But I honestly believed that there was pure goodness in the center of everyone and that we could all live together in peace and harmony if we just had the ability to do that. And that has really been my guiding light throughout my life. And I'm sure that's why I got into my work. And that's why I was attracted to it because when I read Marlowe's book on self-actualization and he talked about a self-actualized person, I just knew that's what I wanted to be. And so, I never I when when I went to Maui in 1971, I really thought that that's what I was going to be able to find there, you know, a, a group of people who thought like I thought and lived like I thought, and to some degree I did. Okay, however, sooner or later, our ego comes into play, and then without clarity to see what's going on, those things disintegrate. So even though I can't say I was disillusioned, but that wasn't it. I knew that wasn't it. Okay. There, there was no doubt in my mind. Plus I knew that drugs were not the answer. So, you know, okay. So I, I know if the, you needed that to, you know, if you, so anyway, so therefore that stayed in me. It wasn't like a burning thing in my consciousness. It just was always there. And then that's why I did my work, because I always knew that the only way the human race could save itself was to raise our consciousness. I don't know how I knew that, but I just always believed that in every fiber of my being. So my work has always been dedicated to do that, to help alleviate suffering and to allow people to, to, to live a real life. Okay. So, and my spirituality was always woven into that because I met Swami Muktananda six months after I started my work. So it was very hard to separate one from the other. And since he was basically saying God dwells within you as you, well, it was the same thing only on a much more subtle and sophisticated and real level, okay? So when I went there, every single person I met was just loving. I mean, I walked into the kitchen because they were making a special meal because I couldn't eat certain things. And I walked in the kitchen and I said, because I'd never been in there before, it was the first time. And I said to the young man who was there, hi, is there anything I need to know? And he looked at me and said, yes, you're beautiful. Okay. Now, I mean, was there anything I needed to know about getting my food, right? Okay. Yes, you're beautiful. Okay. <laughs> and, and that was just, and it wasn't personal. It wasn't like he was flirting with me. That was not the energy at all. There was a purity Well, I don't know any word to say after that. There was just a purity. And it wasn't just about me because one of the other ladies in the Los Angeles Sangha that I belonged to went there too. And she was had a bad leg and a bad back. And she came home and she told me her experience. It sounded like she was telling you my experience. So the love and the care and the kindness and the compassion, it wasn't because it was me, Radha. It was because this is how they treat you.
And so then I got to actually experience while living there that what I believed as a little girl was actually true. I mean, I've known for many years that it's only through a raise in consciousness that we're ever going to save ourselves. I mean, I've known that for a very long time. So that wasn't something I needed him to or them to affirm for me. Um, but nevertheless, seeing it in action, not in one, two or three, but in every single person that you 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 encounter. Um It was just inspiring. It was it was very life changing. It was very life affirming. Can you um, can you give us an idea of the demographic of people mm -hmm. you were there with, age, uh, if you guys share professions or you know spiritual walk or are you specifically people in in the art of healing and in that practice? If you could paint that picture. Well, first of all, there are people from all over the world because he has a Russian interpreter, a uh, uh, Ukrainian, French, Italian, German, uh, uh, Israeli. Uh, uh, and I know because he has interpreters there. So when they ask a question, there's someone right there who will tell him, interpret for him, right? So the, culturally, it's everywhere, it, you know. And there's, you know, there's people from all different religions because it doesn't matter what religion you are. It has nothing to do with religion. OK, mm -hmm. he was raised very Christian, by the way. You should know that. And I think his mother was a Seventh Day Adventist. OK. And um, and so he often makes a lot of references to Jesus based on that. But it's his understanding with his consciousness of what the Bible means. And you know what I mean? So it's OK. But anyway, so. As far and the age, I would say most of the people are younger, younger. I don't mean like 12, but I, most of the people I would say are in their their 30s or their 40s, maybe in their 20s. And then there's some people who are older than that. But I'd say the majority of people are. Um, I think I would say the majority I'm very bad with age and ethnicity. This has never been my I, I, I see right through that when I look at somebody. So it's very hard for me to say how old you are or, or what background you are. OK, <laughs> all right. But I was I would say that most of the people are are, are in their 30s and maybe 40. And there are some families that live there, you know, couples with children. And then there's a whole group of people that live in the village. There's a little village. You can't call it a town because it's not. But a little village and some of the people live there. Cool. Well, I'll just uh, I'll ask the last question because I want to give a little time to Joe. Um, yes. Just, what was your experience as, um, you know, I want to put you, you're, you're, you're out there, but, you know, being an older lady traveling from LA all the way to Portugal and then back and being in a rural small town like you know very different from what you're used to what was that whole experience like well first of all I never went to the town when I go to a meditation center I never leave the meditation center when I go to an ashram I never leave it I'm not there to do anything except be there and have my experience. That's the first thing. That's why I don't have a lot of social interaction. Like I can't tell you how many people were professional or not professional. I have no idea because I had no inner counters like that. In the whole time I was there, I never had one conversation like that, never. But mm -hmm. that's normal for me. I mean, I smile to everyone or I pranam, but I don't interact socially because it doesn't even come up as a desire for me. It's not like I'm going, oh, I'm there to do this. I'm, it's not really like that. It just doesn't come up for me to do. So, I, and I never even went to the little village, okay? And when I was in Lisbon, I never left the hotel, okay? <laughs> so I, I, I was very focused. I knew why I was going and that's what I went there to do, okay? I, I, I don't, um, so I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, Ian. Well, I guess was it like was it a challenge? Like it's a it's a big trip from LA to Portugal and back, and you got COVID. Like, well, the thing was going brave. There was, well, going there was very easy. I mean, I had no trouble on the plane. Everything was fabulous. Um, you know, I was comfortable. I had no pain. Everything was wonderful. 
I had two days to rest at the hotel and I did all my yoga and all my practices in my room. Everything was wonderful. And um, then I got, when I got COVID, well, I've since learned from an acupuncturist and this lady doctor who's a Feldenkrais practitioner, they've told me that the reason I'm not getting better at a quick enough pace is because of COVID that there have been studies that have showed that COVID can exacerbate si physical situations that you already were dealing with, okay? Mm -hmm. So even though when I went there, my I had no pain in my back, my stomach was 100%. So when I went there, I was 100%, okay? And, um, but when I got COVID and it weakened me so much, it attacked my, my weakest points, which is my nervous system, the herpes and the shingle, blah, blah, blah. And my stomach, okay, or my intestines, not my stomach, my intestines. So that's what it attacked. And that's what I'm still dealing with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when in my spine and like I have a lot of um, shingles, things that happen that only come when the shingles are being irritated or the inflammation of the nerve is being irritated. So um, it was a lot on the return. I mean, literally, I had I had to have caregivers twenty four seven, which I've never had in my life, uh, mm -hmm. for three weeks, and then from there I slowly have weaned down, and now I have caregivers three days a week, four hours each day, and I just started driving a little bit. But like this lady that I'm seeing, she's forty five minutes away. She said I would not even allow you to get in the car and drive to me. Any good I could do, you would be undone immediately. I'm not stable enough because whatever level of pain I'm in. I'm not stable enough to, to even get in the pool, which was my best way to swim. So there, I, I realized this, and um, but maybe it seems absurd to say that I have no regret and that if I knew all of this was going to happen to me at a time, I would have gone anyway. Nothing was going to stop me, okay? It's very rare that a teacher invites you. Mm -hmm. And so for him to, when, uh, for me to tell him what I wanted to deal with and what I was addressing, I can't tell you how could it be that I'm dealing with physical things? It, you know what I mean? I, it's not a surprise. In other words, for me to really go through this and come out the other end, I, I could see why this would have happened and is happening. I, I don't know any other way to say that. Now that's not because I think, oh goody, I'm in pain. No, you know, <laughs> the pain is terrible. Sometimes I scream from it, but nevertheless, um, what I receive there is forever. Mm. Well, wow, um, that's super inspiring. Just, just your courage and bravery to make that trip and you know your, your resolve you're so like you said you're going to do it no matter what there's nothing that's going to stop you and um it's super inspiring to me um you know i hope to be able to travel and do things such as these when i'm in my later years as well so thank you so much for sharing thank you everybody here for listening uh thank you anybody who's watching online for listening this was our sacred group Shout out to everybody, and I'm going to stop this now. Give Joe Jeff a little time, a little less than we wanted, but let's get it. Thank you to everyone involved. Peace. Thank you.